Jason. Welcome to Liberty Live. Today we're going to be talking about the Herodian draft and margin masonry. What is that? Why are we discussing it today in Liberty Live? Very simple. All of the stones that you see behind me were chiseled, carved, shaped, and fashioned by Architecton. The word tecton means master builder, construction, working with stone and or wood or metal, were formed expertly for the Beth Dash, the house of God. Now, there are great lessons to learn in this video, so pay attention carefully. First of all, the stones you see behind me were quarried right underneath the temple of God in what is known as Solomon's Quarry or Zedekiah's Cave. Now, we are able to go in there today. Come follow me. In here, Zedekiah fled from Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, when Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem in 586 BC. It is also the place where all of the stones were quarried 500 years before that to make the house of God. It is also said that when Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem and besieged it, that Jeremiah hid the Ark of the Covenant in what's called Jeremiah's Grotto, which actually is a cave system Zedekiah's cave, Zedekiah's tunnel, Solomon's quarry, is all the same place, right underneath ground zero at the Temple Mount. Now let's go in there and look at some of these marks and chisel marks from the stones that were taken. Here's pictures now of the chisel mark stones from the quarry of the wall. Okay, also we have stones coming from the Arzea Abira quarry. Let me show you pictures of this here and here. Now what you're gonna notice is all of these stones were taken out of the bedrock. Now you would say in all of our technology today, some people go, how did they do that? Beloved, we do the same thing today. The difference is we use pneumatics. So for an example, an old world chisel is a chisel, an iron chisel, whether it's flat tooth like a screwdriver, uh, whether it has four teeth or three teeth, which depends on uh, the time frame for which it was brought forth, and it was used with a hammer. Nowadays, they use it what's called pneumatic or air or gas powered, which is when you have a chisel connected to a device which is driven by air power. And that air power acts as a hammer so you can hold the device with your hand, much like uh, dental tools. A lot of those are pneumatic. A lot of the uh, vehicle tools and auto body are pneumatic. And it basically means that they're powered by battery or electricity, which converts it into air power, which converts it then into a, a driving shaft or a motor, cylindrical or rotary, which will allow the tool to oscillate, move forward, spin, or as, as needed. Now, the method, however, of extracting stones is the same. I wanna show you here from extracting some of the largest marble in the world. Now we have caterpillars, tractors, pneumatic drills, and, uh, and saws but it's the same technique. We drill into the stone and then we apply pressure to split it. Now, in the olden days, which is still practiced today by many sculptors and tectons, if you have a big block and you have a saw blade this big, which means you can only go about this deep. Keep in mind, for every saw blade that's this big, 12 inches, 14 inches, 10 inches, you don't even get half that because you have the spindle and the screw in the clasp. So let's just say you have a saw blade this big. Here's a picture. Then you have the spindle or clasp, which is this big, which means for a 10 inch saw blade, you have three and a half inches only that you can cut through, okay, on either side. Which means if I have a 10 inch blade and a 10 inch block, I can only get three and a half inches through the block. So let's say I cut three and a half inches in, I flip it on the other side and cut three and a half inches in, I can only cut seven inches total. So I could cut a seven inch block with a 10 inch blade, both sides, or a three and a half inch block, I can cut the 10 inch blade, but nothing more. So what do I do if I have a 10 inch block? Very simple. I drill holes in the center and I instill what's called feathers. And it's a device that goes like this. So I put this in the hole and I put a chisel or a wedge on the inside, which then I drive it through and it splits it kind of like drywall or sheetrock screws. It, it almost is this principle where you drive something in, it goes like this. And on this side, you have the same technique. So when this drives in, it forces pressure to cause this to open, which causes cylindrical force down the rock and through the fault, the rock will split. After that, we take chisels and clean it up. But many times, here's an example of a stone that was split with feathers. You can see the drill holes and then uh, where the rock naturally split. 
right here. And I also want to tell you about the Herodian drafted margin masonry. Uh, is when you have a stone like this, and you notice that there's a frame or border around uh, the stone. Now that's accomplished by chisels. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a video chiseling a stone outside. Just to give you an example of how they, it's called dressing the stone. They make a border and everything that's not the border, this face is called the boss or bossage. Now, sometimes you'll see a limestone wall uh, like here and the bossage is actually sticking out. So if you were to look at it from the side, they would all have a round face or a more natural look. And other times, like in the Herodian building, we see the bossages are flat. Now, what purpose does this have besides beauty? It's amazing. Um, by framing the stones, one is able, I'll show you an example here, one is able to line up the stones when you're getting them into place, you can line them up exactly because of your vantage point that the end of the stone would disappear normally and you're not sure moving horizontally or, vertic or vertically or horizontally laterally how to line them up perfectly. But this frame, it's like a ruler. It gives you not only a line within a line, but it gives you a proximity line before your two lines meet. Now in doing so, these ended up being so tight together with no glue, no mortar, that even today we couldn't fit a credit card in between there. Amazing. Okay, now what does this all have to do with Herodian draft and margin masonry? Very simple. You need to understand that what's called boss and bossage are the edges that protrude out of the rocks. Here's an example of some here. And what you need to know is different tectons Different masons, different kings required and dressed what's called dressing a stone different ways. So for an example, in the Western Wall, look at the Western Wall here. Now look at the Western Wall here with all these squares. You can tell the different time dispensations and kingdoms and ruling authorities and powers by the style in which they are fashioned. Can you imagine you move into a house? It's new to you, but the house is built in the 1900s or the 1970s. How would you tell? Very simple. Look at the way in which it was built. Is it made by bricks, stone, veneer? Do you have marble floors? Are they vinyl and they look like marble? Is it wood? Is it wood uh, covered? Is it a veneer of wood? Is it laminate? Is it not real wood, but it looks like real wood? See, these are all different innovative techniques that were made later on. Now, one thing that's amazing, stone never goes out of style, nor does wood, nor does organic home cooking, nor does a candle, nor does a Bible with real pages. In a digital age, you must know how amazing it is to write a letter, send it in the mail, right? And to know that what Jesus Christ chiseled on you, a living stone, still matters. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this Herodian Draft and Margin Masonry. Herod made the Herodian Draft and Margin Masonry stones, and he put a border. He framed it, if you will. He put a border around the sides so that you could fit the stones together and see where you're going because of the border. It, it would almost be like adding uh, uh, lines on a ruler or a grid. Some people use grids in their paper. They take the tab in by two inches and they follow the lines. Now, do you know, even when the Torah was written, they made score marks so we could stay on the line. This is why even in the old world tectons, that they did what's called scoring, where they made a line, uh, if you will, to to follow the line, to follow the lead, to follow a measuring system, to keep uniform, to keep clear, to keep crisp. Even architects and drafters use this to even have graph paper for graphing, which has many lines you can keep on track. Now, when we put frames or lines around stone, you can understand now that we're making a grid like Tetris or build a block to build things together in a way that is orderly and organized. Now, the other thing you need to know is in the Herodian drafted margin masonry, there's something that's called uh, like coupling. You ever cross your fingers like this and they're one short, one long, one short, one long, one short, one long, one short, one long. And by doing so, it creates a grip that almost can't be broken. They do the same thing in, uh, in woodworking called dovetailing, where they take something that looks like uh, a dovetail or a V uh, like this or a D, I guess, or a triangle, and they cut another one on the other side so it locks like this. They think it's the strongest bond you could basically make. Now, 
in the same way, if you look at all the sides in which uh, here we found on the side of the temple in its day, the side of Robinson's Arch, here's an example here, we can see the original stones that they're put one short, one long, one short, one long, one short, one long, like uh, horizontal L's, if you will. And by doing so, this created such unity, such connection, such adherence, and such strength that the walls of the temple were able to survive the most major earthquakes in the day. Okay, so I want to tell you how Herod did this. It's called a header and sketcher bond, or uh, a wall coin. And what happens is, if you only have headers, you show the heads of the bricks, which is essentially cutting them in half. For sketcher, you put the long end of the brick down and lay them laterally. To do a header and sketcher bond on a coin, the corner of the wall, you basically put one long and then take the other long one and lay it here, making an L or V pattern, depending on which way you're looking at it. And it's interlocking them like knuckles. And again, by doing so, Herod, inspired by God, by the way, uh, made such a strong wall that it survived massive earthquakes that would have shaken all other stonework down. And I want to show you for an example uh, what interlocking the stones would look like. So you have, <clears throat> this would be your header. That would be your sketcher. Okay, long ways. So if you stack them up like this, which again you can see looks like an L or a V, then instead of adding another header upon the header or a sketcher upon the sketcher, you're going to start cross stacking them like this. And so you see that you start getting a, a, a cross thatch pattern, like weaving, if you will, weaving the stones. And again, by creating a, a design like this, they were uh, impenetrable for the Romans and the earthquakes that would fall upon the land uh, during their day. And then again, this course would go this way, that course would go this way, and you can see how the stones begin to interlock and form a great and mighty wall, which we still found, for example, in the earthquakes during the King Uzziah. There was a massive earthquake that we found many layers of destruction still today, and it's biblically recorded. But the temple survived all of this because of the style of its tecton ship architecture, which was unmatched in its day. It would still be unmatched beyond the wonders of the world because it was formed and made actually by God. Someone said, well, you said that was Herod's temple. Well, Herod was the one that God used to do it. But there's this prophecy in Haggai that says, behold, I will beautify in those days it comes to pass the house of the Lord with unsurpassing beauty, which means that though some people say the temple gained beauty and lost holiness, actually God beautified it. The people became unholy because they denied Messiah, our Savior. But God, who is holy, beautified his house and will do it again. I want you to know that also these chisels are like signatures, fingerprints, if you will. We find the tomb of the Lord, right? And it's empty. Hallelujah. It is empty. So someone says, well, I think that tomb was made later and saying that it was there. Hey, look for yourself. Go in the back of the tomb and look at the top of the wall and tell me the chisel marks that you see, the fingerprints of the iron chisel. Are they four tooth? Are they three tooth? And tell me when four tooth and three tooth came out and you'll be able to date the tomb. In the same way, look at all the rocks again on the wall and you can see that the boss and bosses changes from the Hashmoneans to the Byzantines to the Herodian to the Umayyads and also even nowadays you have choices to make what type of boss that you want whether it looks organic shaped or called again dressed is when you shape the stone and believe me beloved some of these are shaped entirely by chisels and some of them are left what's called unhewn when you hew a stone you are actually changing the shape and or appearance of the stone for life now in the kingdom of God they're unhewn and hewn stones for an example when you make an altar to the Lord you're not able to use hewn stones. You cannot dress it, you can't shape it, you can't manipulate it, you can't change it. Now, is that always the way? No, just like sometimes you have unleavened bread, sometimes you have leavened bread. Sometimes you feast and sometimes you fast. When you make an altar, you come to God, you can't shape yourself up. You come as you are because we're living stones. If you manipulate the way you appear before you come to the Lord, 
something in you says I'm not good enough as I am or God wants something else of me to approach him but we know we come boldly by grace as we are now God doesn't leave us that way interesting that the early leadership in the church all the way back to Mount Sinai God called them the Sanhedrin that the called out ones the assembled ones and he basically then in the temple there was a place where they met here and it was called the chamber of hewn stone in other words this stones were hewn they were shaped they were refined when you come to god you come as you are but he then saves you then he sanctifies you which means he chisels shapes refines purifies uh after you suffered you're strengthened and established in other words after you go through the processes of christendom the processes of transformation the processes of maturation into the image of jesus christ then you fit perfectly together so what i will tell you is if you feel God chiseling away at your corners and framing you and shaping you in a way that's uncomfortable and something you're not used to and it's different to what you know, how you were born, what you were taught, what you were trained, what you have, are, have been accustomed to experiencing, I would tell you, let God shape. Let God refine. Let him chisel. Let him mold. Let him build because he's the master architecton. He knows what he's doing and he's doing this so you can fit together perfectly to endure all things. Now, these stones are movable. Some of them are 50 tons, 100 tons. On the bottom, underneath he here, where the road was, underneath there, we can go today and we see a stone. And it has what looks like two by four indentions in it. Now, we found some of those that were protrusions left out of the rock to move them. And others, wood was placed in that and they were put on carts to spin it. I'll show you some images here of how they moved the stones and archaeology supports these claims now concerning the uh mega stones here's an example of one of the mega stones we found on the bottom of the western wall complex underneath the hotel or the western wall on the original street level where messiah jesus walked these blocks are made out of limestone quarried right under uh, zedekiah's cave or solomon's quarry which is underneath what was called the Beth HaMikdash, the house of God, Mount Moriah. Mori teach Yah, Yahweh, the place where Yahweh will teach us from the temple, from the first church headquarters ever in Jesus' name. Now this block here, what's interesting is we find these little rectangular, uh, they're chiseled out in rectangular shapes, but there's a couple protrusions. Now on the ashlar stones like this that we found rectangles missing, uh, that's kind of up to the imagination except for on the ones that we found protrusions again some of them were made out of limestone and they were part of the stone they were just left unchiseled and others they were actually inserted out of wood or other types of stone and this uh, matched with what we know about archaeology and original uh, masonry techniques we understand how they then moved these so say you have a bunch of logs simple logs to roll and you can use a wedge and get a log under it. And now, next thing you know, you use this as a teeter and you put a rope around it, right? Now, all of a sudden, you can see how this would be used to pull the stone over the rollers. You could move an unlimited amount of weight over rollers. Uh, they still use these techniques today uh, in many uh, facets. This is a system like pulleys and levers. You get the idea. Um, and this allows a lot of manpower to be converted into uh, enough power, man plus ox, to move things that are immovable. And this is also why ox represents strength in Hebrew, the, the phonetic language of uh, Aleph or the Spirit of God is likened to the strength of an ox because it represents something man cannot do by himself. Uh, as a matter of fact, we still use the term horsepower in vehicles, like 180, 400 horsepower because Horses can pull things that we just can't pull by ourselves. Now we have technology and machines and we still use these terms because of our origins. So this gives us insight on how they move such stones and again, what these protrusions are really uh, all about. And again, we find these in uh, some smaller stones that were stacked upon the larger stones uh, that are still seen underneath uh, the Temple Mount today using pulleys. Uh, draft and pulling, ox power, manpower. In other words, that would be the difference of you uh, trying to move a 100-pound block by yourself or, or you use a dolly and tip it over and then wheel it where it needs to go. So you have to work smata, not hata.
That's what I always tell my children, and they laugh and receive it gladly. So, in the same way, God has methods that we are unaware of. God has technology that has not been done ever before, and he has technology that worked since the beginning that we can't outdo. Now, at the same time, you have to remember, some of these things we go, how did they do this? God did it. It's written in a word, unless the Lord builds a house, the builders labor in vain. But if the Lord builds a house, it's built in Jesus' name. Beloved, you are living stones. Let God shape. Let him refine. Let him chisel. Let him work your stone to fit in his wall. Let the Lord allow you to fit in his kingdom, for surely you were called. Now you must be faithful. Or who will tell the Lord, what are you making? What are you doing? Does the clay have right to save the potter? What doest thou? But I tell you, put your life in the hands of the potter. Put your life in the hands of the tecton, your stone. Unveil it to his chisel and let the Lord shape. For surely what the Lord does is good and it shall endure forever.